Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Everton show. Well, the first team players are back from their warm weather training trip to Dubai. We're back in Premier League action at the weekend. And I'm glad to say Kevin Kilban is back amongst old friends. <laughs> I'd like to say you're here at Finch Farms to see me, Kev, but that's not the case. You've been to see Wayne Rooney. No, it's true. I always like to come and see uh, the best uh, dressed man in, uh, in, <laughs> in Finch Farm. So Leighton Baines, I love to see Leighton Baines when I'm round here. Yeah, you're, you're three or four. You're, you're down the list somewhere, Dadley, you know, but you're looking well today. This is my best club, it is. <laughs> he speaks well, Wayne, doesn't he? He does. Um, I mean, I watched, I'm sure a lot of Evertonians would have watched Monday Night Football last, uh, or two weeks ago it would have been now, wouldn't it? And he, he, he was excellent on that. And I think, mm. I think Wayne, across the course of his career, I think he's always spoke well. I, I don't think he, I don't think he's, he's certainly got the credit he deserves, maybe with, his, with the way that he's maybe gone about his interviews. Because I just think, I think he's been very candid at times, but he's not needed to give things away. Mm. When Wayne is Wayne, like we saw on Monday Night Football, you, you, that's exactly how he is. He's straight to the point. He's um, he's very truthful. He's very honest, and it's exactly what you'd want from a say from a teammate or from say from yourself or anything. If you're going to be interviewing uh, Wayne, he's he's great. Yeah. So and you've known him since he was 16 years of age, haven't you? I know. It just that's what you're starting to reminisce a little bit, really, when you're thinking about the days up at Belfield and you're thinking about the times that we spent on the training ground and and how he went about things. I, I think that was the, maybe the, the one thing that I wanted to try to 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 get from him to like you know how has he adapted over the year because the one thing that stuck out to me when he was 16 17 was his desire every single day on the training ground is 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 would you want to say pursuit of perfection but he he was a perfectionist he wanted to do everything to the best of his ability and if things didn't go right from the training ground he'd kick you he he would he was he was an ultimate winner he was he was he had one of the best attitudes if not the best attitude mm. I would have seen from in professional football and he still has and congratulations by the way on the birth of his newborn son and that's the reason that Wayne couldn't accompany his teammates and the coaching staff to Dubai the rest of the lads went there though and it went well. There's been so many changes with staff and playing staff. Then uh, getting to know each other a little bit better is always very important. You've got such a big squad, it's difficult for everyone to sort of um, spend time together. I know you, you might find that hard because we see each other every day, but you know normally there's not too much downtime after training. So obviously coming away together um, sort of forces your hand in that way. But it's good, especially for the boys that came in in January. Um, it's nice for them to. To go away with the boys and, and kind of get to know them a bit more, um, so it's nice to get away and and, um, and bond a little bit more and do things together outside of football. And it speeds up the recovery of playing like this. They've got one of the best healing processes over my shoulder, and that's the sea. And uh, getting the lads in the sea and getting them uh, swimming in the sea it not only helps the players' recovery of train, but also the injured players to recover from their injuries. And uh, and of course, uh, there is no tie down to how many treatments they can have. They don't have to get home to the to the wife and the families. You know, they're here 24/7, and we can fit lots more sessions and lots more treatment to get their lads recovered quicker. There's a, there's a real contrast of, of who needs what while we're out here, but the overall aim for for them all really is is um, some rest and recuperation, um, little bits of, uh, of sunlight exposure which uh, is good physically and mentally um, but yeah th th there's a real mix of the group um, and it's just making sure that the players that, that need slightly more rest and recovery for varying reasons they get it and the players that may need a little bit more exposure to training load um, and, and match type activities then we've made sure that they're going to get that as well so hopefully by the time we all go back We've all had a period of, of rest and recovery, but individual players have had what they need on an individual basis. Yeah, I think it's been great for the staff point of view. It takes them in a different environment. You know, you obviously got the weather, so you can do a lot more work on the training field. I think the players are benefiting. They've been working really hard. Of course, it's different conditions. You're back home at Finch Farm, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, they're working hard, get a good sweat on, and we've, we've, we've done well in the training room. Yeah, it's difficult. It takes it out of you, I'm not going to lie, especially for me. Um, not really used to it as, as some of the other players but um, I think I prefer training in this than, than in the rain and, and the wind in the UK but um, no, it's nice, you get used to it over, after a few days but uh, it, it is tough, yeah. You've been on plenty of those mid-season trips, <coughs> pre-season trips, Kev, what, what, yeah. what are the main benefits? I think it has to be about coming together. There's there's been a lot of change here at, uh, at Everton in the last what last couple of years. You look, only need to look at the, the signings that came in across the, the summer. 
the pre-season they would have had together and a lot of upheaval if had the manager leaving have they really had time to gel of course through the January transfer window a lot of new signings coming into the club so I think it's, it's the perfect opportunity for a manager for the, the, the team themselves to get to know each other a little bit and I think that's of course what, what the trips are about but yeah work hard I'm sure that's the one thing that's stressed but mm. I think it is at times it is something that's overlooked and it's maybe something that's a, a lot more overlooked now in, in, in the modern day about the time that you actually have off the field because you can only be on the, on the training ground for a certain amount of time. It is about maybe getting together, having a meal, having a beer, having a glass of wine and it's certainly no harm in it and I think that's certainly the, the, the benefits from, from these trips away. I often like speaking about the, the trip we went on in 2004 to Houston in Texas <laughs> yeah. when David Moyes took the players away. There was a few staff along Along the, on the trip did you as make well. that one, did you? I was one of them. Oh, I yeah. made the cut yeah, for that one. Yeah, you enjoyed it, did you? Yeah. And I did enjoy it because it yeah. was terrific and you, you could just see the way that, that the lads were bonding because we'd had a poor season the year before. Yeah. We'd lost Wayne or we were in the process of losing Wayne to Manchester United. Yeah. But from that trip, went on to finish fourth in the Premier League. Yeah, and do you know the one thing that sticks in my mind, I think, from it was just maybe prior to that trip, I think we went to Burnley. We went to Burnley and we lost a pre-season friendly. We'd had a, we'd had, I think we'd lost a crew in that pre-season. We, we, we were having a really bad time. Mm. There, was a, there was a potential takeover going on at the club at the time as well. I think there was a little bit of uncertainty, even around David Moyes at that time. There was yeah. a lot of pressure on David Moyes um, over that, um, that summer. As you say, with Wayne leaving as well, I don't think that maybe helped everything. And I think, I, I think it helped everyone getting away, getting to, to Houston. We were, you know, of course, well away from maybe the the, the, the trouble and maybe the, the upheaval that was going on back here at, uh, in Liverpool. And I think that certainly helped us. And I think we were able to get out. We had a couple of rounds of golf together. Yes, we trained hard because it was pre-season. That, mm. was the, that was, of course, the priority. But we were able to get out. We are having a few beers together. We had a meal together. And I think that was the beginning of something very special, I think, for that squad yeah. of players. It, we, we, we came together on that trip. And we knew coming back... This has got to be about how we go forward now quickly together and it, it, it all happened across the course of that season brilliantly for us all. Terrific set of lads, weren't they? Yeah. Which, which you need for that type of bonding session to even work. I think back at the... the I, I wouldn't have had so many characters, so many leaders in a squad at any stage of my career. Um, you know, if I look at Alan Stubbs, Duncan Ferguson, David Weir, Lee Carsley, Steve Watson, you know, I, Nigel Martin, I could go through it, you know, time, time and time again, we had characters galore in that squad, real leaders who were all probably captains in their own right, I think, in many respects. And and it was great to be part of that squad. And, and you know, I think it's probably the proudest period I would have had in my career. What mm. happened that summertime, what happened across the course of that season, I mean, forget about Kevin Campbell as well, that was even still part of that squad at that time as well. The way we came together, because we were up against it a little bit, there was a lot of pressure on us all. And we had a small squad as well. And I think we were able to give a little bit of freedom to Tommy Gravison early on in the season and he went on and expressed himself in a certain way that we were able to maybe form him behind him because he was, he was such a good player, Tommy. And I think in general we, we did. It, we come together and I said it was probably the proudest I would have had um, or the proudest feeling I would have had through my career. One of the big plus points, one of the many plus points I would think to come out of the trip to Dubai was the sight mm. of Leighton Baines back in training. Yeah, I think, I, I think when Everton have, have struggled early on this season, I think you look at the... Everton's back four over the last five or six years. Predominantly, it's I think Everton have had two of, if not the two best fullbacks in the Premier League, in Seamus Coleman and Leighton Bain. So when you lose two of your key players like Everton have done, mm. uh, I think it's always going to hurt the side. And Leighton Bain's getting back fit. I think it's a huge priority for Everton. I'm, I'm you know, I. I've got nothing but great things to say about Leighton Baines and, and how he's gone about things, how he's applied himself over the years. But getting him back on the training ground, getting him back, first of all, yet yeah, training in amongst the squad themselves and then getting him back on the pitch at Goodison, I think, I think that can only be a good thing. And I think it'll help the rest of the players, for, just for continuity, it'll help everyone around him. Duncan Ferguson was speaking over in Dubai about Jenk Tosin, who was, uh, hasn't adapted as quickly as he would have liked to. Yeah. in English football, but Duncan said he's looked really sharp, he's looked really good in training over there, so that trip could be could be the making of the boy, because it, it, it must be difficult to come over from the Turkish league to the Premier League. I think, you know what, we've, we've seen so many over the years, haven't we, at various clubs, and you know, even the lads that I would have had here, here at, uh, at Everton, at Goodison, we would have had lads come in who struggled, who's come in on big fees and struggled mm. from coming from various leagues around the world, and it's a huge culture change for him, isn't it? I think that's the one thing we, we've all got to, we've got to accept. That it might, it might not necessarily be this season we're going to see the best out of him. It might be next season. It might be even beyond that. It's almost as if now we're, we, we are expecting players, we're expecting too much of players mm. too quickly. And it is difficult. It is hugely difficult just to adapt to 
training style, then of course then to adapt to day-to-day -day life. And I think that's the thing realistically for him. I think he's got to get a base, he's got to get settled here with his family, whoever it is that's going to be coming over with him. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sure we'll see the best of him because he is talented, he is talented. Yeah. I've seen some of the clips on, on, the, on, your, uh, on your Twitter feed that you've been putting out over the last week. So you can see the talent that he's got. He is, he's, a, he's, a, he's a talent and hopefully we can get the best out of him here now over the, over the next year or two. Well, let's hope so. And that just about wraps it up for part one of this week's Everton show. Coming up after the break, we'll hear from Cuco Martina and, of course, plenty more from Kevin Kilbar. Welcome back to part two. I'm at USM Finch Farm in the company of Kevin Kilban. You touched on Seamus Coleman before, Kevin. How mm. big a boost is it for club and country, of course, to yeah. have him back? I'm thinking from a selfish point of view from Ireland, of course. Um, I think... I think in general, you know, it was a, it was a massive blow. I think to the end of Ireland's World Cup campaign that we didn't have Seamus in, involved in the, in the last few games. But I think from certainly from an Everton perspective as well, you're looking. I mentioned before. I think he's been the most consistent right back over the last what you probably say six or seven years since he's mm -hmm. made his breakthrough into the side. I I personally think, and, I, and again, I'm biased, but. I just love watching him develop the way that he, the, the lad he's developed into, but certainly the player he's developed into as well. I think the, the potential was there, I think, when he signed, but not many players go on to fulfil it. And he's gone, he's gone to do that and he's gone to maybe exceed any sort of, uh, any sort of expectations that were around him. But I think, I think he needed, I think from a personal point of view as well, I think he played in the 23 game, uh, I guess that Southampton, I think it was, in the 23 game in his, in his first game back. And listening to him talking about that, saying, how he needed to go through and a tackle, make a tackle to feel mm. good about himself. Then, his performance in the Leicester game was just simply outstanding. Just to, to, for such a long, a long time out to come back, it showed, it showed the, the, the character of him, it showed mm. the measure of him as a player, but also his energy level. So, I think that that is a massive plus for for Everton in the in the course of well look, the next three or four months, I suppose. Now till we got to the end of the season. If he plays against Watford, Vicarage Road at the weekend, it will be his 250th appearance for Everton. So. Mm. Clawed back most of the sixty grand we paid for him. Yeah, I mean. I, I, let's be fair. He's he's probably been the bargain of the last Ugh. last. But I, I don't know. Maybe across my across the course of my career, I don't remember. There, maybe some people can throw things at me, but I don't remember a signing that's had a bigger impact both for club and country mm. as Seamus Coleman. I, I don't recall it. He's been an absolute bargain, but. You know, you'll know him as you'll know him like most people would know him as well. Certainly around this club, it, it's, it isn't about how good he is as a player. He's such a great lad. He's very mm. amenable. He's he's he fits perfectly in to what Everton is about, and that is what that's what he's done across the course of his career. He, it's, he's had a, he's had an amazing career. And he's I think a perfect he's, ambassador, isn't he, for for Everton and also for Irish football as well? Because you know I know everybody over there is so proud of him. Well, definitely, I think Irish football thinks one, uh, Darren, because th I think the Irish league in general gets a lot of criticism, um, but I think. Our side, the Irish side, over the last 10 years, we've had Kevin Doyle, we've had Shane Long, we've had Stephen Ward, of course we've had Seamus Coleman, we've had Wesley Houlihan as well now that's made the breakthrough in the last four or five years properly as well. We've had so many players that have played in the League of Ireland and I think that's got to be, it's got to give hope to everyone playing League of Ireland, whatever mm. age you're at now, mm. that you can go and emulate what Seamus, what Seamus has done here. And he's almost like now the, the, the torchbearer, he's the one now that every sort of Irish player, every youngster coming in can say, well look, if you don't necessarily go to England at 15, 16, like, which historically was the, the, the standard route mm. into English football, you can actually get there when you're 19, 20, 21, you don't necessarily need to go early and I think now, I think yeah, Seamus is certainly that, that player that's, that every Irish player can aspire to be now, he's, he's the modern day um, I don't know, you'd probably say Roy Keane, Johnny Giles because yeah. of how, how he's gone about it across his career. He has been an incredible signing for Everton Football Club of that, there is no doubt. Right, let's turn our attentions now to the weekend visit to Vicarage Road when we play Watford in the Premier League. This is Cuco Martinez's take on that one. They have also really great players and great squad and uh, we know it will be difficult. But still, we, 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 uh, we trust in our squad and we know that we are much better than them. And one of the players you will probably come directly up against is somebody Evertonians will know well, Gerard Delafeu. So that must be a challenge you're looking forward to. No, of course. Um, when I play also at Southampton, I play against him and yeah. I know the way of playing and, you know, it will be fun. Do you study your opponents beforehand, people you've, you're going to come directly up against and see how they play? No, of course. Um, if I asked uh, one of the uh, staff, you know, uh, to help me to select some views of, of the players, of course. But still, you know, um, 
we are a great squad, great players, and we know that we can beat them. And that's the first thing that we need to do now. Kuko Martina recently, Kevin, has been putting in some good, solid performances. He had the assist as well for Umar and he asked recently. Yeah. And it can't be easy being asked to play out of position, which is what the boys done. Yeah. Um, if you'd have asked me, if you said to me, Kev, look, I, I did play a little bit at left back, predominantly, of, of course, as maybe in, in left, at left midfield, but I played towards the end of my career at left back. If you'd have said to me, go and play right back, <laughs> oh, I tell, I, I, first of all, you, you know as well as I do, I couldn't use it. That was totally for standing on. But I think the one thing that maybe it is quite striking, if I ever, I actually played right side centre half once. Believe it or not, I did play right side centre half. And the, I, honestly, the, 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 I think the, the problem that I would have found, even when I would have played on the right hand side of midfield at times, it's your shoulder because you're so used to playing with your back to to maybe um, to the infield on you. Everything's mm. in front of you to your left hand side. All of a sudden, everything's it's an adjustment. I've do, right. done something from when I was four or five years old. I played predominantly as a left sider, and all of a sudden, then you're playing on the right. Your shoulders all wrong. You're trying to get your body position right. You, you're losing your marker. You're losing lads. So you're losing lads who you're meant to be marking. Mm. I think everything you've got to take into account and. Uh, I think anyone that does it, they deserve a lot of credit yeah. because it's very, very and difficult. And he's done well. Yeah, well, there you go. It'll be a tough game at Wofford. Yeah, I, I mean, they started off brilliantly, didn't they? And mm. I watched them at the start of the season. I think certainly the two, I mean, we'll know, everyone will know, Gerard De La Feu, I think he was excellent in that Chelsea game recently. Richarlison on the, on the left-hand side, he's really mm. impressed me this season. I think one of the standout midfielders has been Decore. I think he's been absolutely brilliant across the course of this season as well. So there's certainly three. One, of course, Everton will be familiar with. The other two, Everton, you know, watching those two this season are very, very good. So I think if you keep those quiet, then I think you've got a real chance against them because they've got, they've got, yes, they've got a powerful side. Mm. Of course, they've got the option with Dini up front or if it's Andre, but certainly Dini brings that physicality to them. They can go direct into them and they can play different ways. And personally, I, I like Seaside's mi mixing up. I like Seaside that can play direct and can play nice uh, passing and attractive style. And certainly Watford can do that. Javier Grazia came over to English football. We didn't know a great deal about him. There's been a, a symmetry to his results so far, a mm. win, a draw and a defeat. But the 4-1 demolition of Chelsea is one of the... Yeah scorelines of the season in the Premier League. Yeah, so it was. That, some might say you got Chelsea on a bad day. Yes, and that, that could you could argue that case, but you've still got to take your chances. You've mm -hmm. still got to perform the way that they did in that night. And uh, you know, I think it was the night actually that Wayne was on Monday Night Football, and it was it was just a brilliant all round performance from them. The way they went about it with real pace. And I think the one thing with Watford, you watch them. If if they get the tails up in any game across this season, when I've seen them. They're almost going for that jugular constantly, and there's no real fear. There's no uh, there's no real thought about defending at times. They'll actually keep on attacking you. So certainly with the pace they've got and creativity in the side, it's it's a tough place to go and uh, to get a result. Yeah. Everybody's excited about the potential of the partnership of Seamus and Theo Walcott. Yeah. And quite rightly so. Yeah, it is. Um, both bringing different different dynamics to the game as well. Th watching Theo Walcott, how he's been playing and performing over the last. Uh, Last while since coming in to, to Goodison, he's adjusted very well. He looks, mm. I mean, he is, he's, he's a quality footballer. Yeah. And, and sometimes, I think we all do forget, sometimes you can be at a club for a while and you need that move to, to freshen yourself, to get yourself back and some motivation back in the system. And I know it's easy, it's the, the, the level or something that would be level that plays all the time and you're earning this amount, you should have that motivation. But it's not always that sim simplistic, mm. it's not always that way. And I think Theo Wilcock coming in here, you can see immediately, yes, he is, he is right at it. He's wanting to maybe, maybe show one or two people who've doubted him in the past. And I think that, that can be a good thing. Mm. But the relationship with, with Coleman, I think that's got to give every Evertonian you know, that little bit of a boost at what, what can be. And I think the potential certainly is there, yeah. Definitely. Let's finish by speaking about your own post-playing career, Kevin. You were never do we really, really want to chat about that, do we? <laughs> <laughs> It'll kill 30 seconds. <laughs> you were never tempted by the coaching route, really, were you? I, I was coaching uh, up at Hull for a while. I was taking the under-23s. I took, I took the under-23s for about uh, 10 months, it was. I was actually injured at the time. I was still under a player's contract, but I took the reserves. And it was maybe an opportunity that, that, was, that was presented to me that I took, and I enjoyed. I enjoyed doing it. And uh, it was Nicky Barnby, who was the manager at the time. Nick was then sacked. And I understand then the precarious position mm. of anyone in football clubs. It can be, it can change so quickly. And so I just thought to myself, look, I actually Lee Carsley, who everyone would know, Lee, Lee asked me, Lee asked me to go down to Coventry. He said, look, will you come back and sign and carry on playing for another year, and with a view to continuing coaching down there? So I said yes. I went down, maybe for Lee, um, more than anything, I suppose. And I knew straight away. I knew within 
four or five weeks of the season that I didn't have it in me. I, and it was my legs, I didn't have the power left in my legs. And predominantly with me, I was a, a runner. I couldn't play, but I could run. <laughs> I could run. <laughs> and I knew I just didn't have that, that power that was in my legs. I was getting overran in games. And I just thought to myself quite quickly, I need to make a decision here because I was getting embarrassed when I was playing in matches. Um, yeah, you might again. You might say yeah, that happened quite regular, but but no, I knew myself. I did know myself, Darren, and I I, I wanted then. I I'd, I'd done a little bit of uh, media work at the Euros. I, I missed the Euros with injury, so well, I was working with Five Live out there. Five Live asked me to come back and do bits and bobs uh, again for them. So I was working on the odd game here and there. Then I, I got asked to do a bit of Sky. Then I got asked to work with BBC TV. And then at the end of that season, I had a decision to make: was I then going to take that, go back into coaching, or was I going to take the media? And I thought, no. I wanted to spend a bit of time with my kids. I mm. wanted to try and give them a little bit back from the time that I'd missed out on, uh, on them growing up. And I decided then I'd go into, into media. And it's, it, it's great to be, to be mm. part of it. And I'm, and I'm loving every minute of it, yeah. It is going terrifically well. Thanks very much for finding Cheers. the time to fit us in, by the way. Oh, Look, yeah. <laughs> very much appreciated. That's just about it for this week's Everton show. And if you want an omen, the last time we played a Premier League game on the 24th of February was back in 2007, away to Watford, and we won 3-0. Wouldn't we take that again? Thanks for watching. Do join us again in seven days' time. You've been watching The Everton Show on YouTube. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm sure you have. Don't forget to subscribe, and that way you can catch every single future episode.